Right. Right, here we go. It's only Britain's Hidden History Live number 87. And they said it would never last. Take it away, Arnie B. Right, who was first this week? Johnny Nigma, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing, Johnny? Oh, let's just twiddle about with this. <coughs> Excuse me. Excellent, Santa Price. Hello, heavens. Oh, I'm having a good chat. I'm sorry. Wilson and Blackett nailed it. Ha ha ha, yes. Gonna see about this, right? Hello, Brian from Plethley. David, hello, David. Chris Wood, Hugh Evans. Hello, everyone. Hello, 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 hello. I thought it was early, but it's already a big long queue. Yes, yeah, great to see so. Oh my goodness! I just saw the people online. So, yeah, sorry we're a bit late this week. I'm really sorry about that. But give everyone a chance, a little chat, say hello. <clears throat> Keep going, Arnie B. Whoop, what happened? That's the end of the piece. Well, that's it, I'll play it again. Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> there we go. All right, so say hello to a few more people. So, you've got stacks crammed in tonight. It's been so busy. Marco, hello Marco, good to see you on. Gavin Lloyd. <coughs> oh dear, I'm a bit uh, croaky. What's happened there? Sorry about that. Hope you can hear me okay. Marcel, good evening. Hello, Susan, Suzanne. Wow, there's so many comments. I tell you what, it's quite interesting just looking at the comments, isn't it? I can see why people come on early and just have a good chat on there. Oh, right, okay. Very nice, Arnie. Right, tonight got so many things. Update on King Arthur Conspiracy, Lay Hunters, Welsh Stories, um, the big story, Moses, of course, as well, which is going to tie in with the Russian scientist. Thank you, Arnie. Beautiful. Oh, you. <coughs> Are you going to be producer? Yep. You're going to come and sit next to me? Yeah, I can I'll just squeeze this camera around a bit. Pull up Take the pressure off you a little bit. Okay, just make sure that's working. You can see me. Yep, you can indeed. Can't see all of me, but there you go. That's one of the pearls having a remarkably large head. <coughs> Can't get all of it on the screen, but there we are. Very good for heading footballs, my head. Though. Big, hard forehead. <coughs> right, hello. Another thing to go on the collection here. Thank you very much to Alan. Uh, Mr. Alan Reese, who gave me this as a little present there, which is the Argoif, for those who know. you got Ra for the power. From, this is from Camera Glyphics in Welsh. you got Ra, power. And then you've got the goose. And the goose... Is Gwyth in Welsh and Gwyth is knowledge. You got knowledge of the power. Ra Gwyth. And Ra Gwyth is the Lord. And here we are on a Sunday and it's the Lord. So that's all good. <coughs> oh dear, I need a bit croaky. Sorry about that. What's happened there? Hopefully that will pass. I feel pretty good though. So uh, I'm going to go through all these things. Um, where's the chat gone on? Huh? Um, oh, sorry, I'm back on this one. Ah, right, Fomenko, here we go, look at that. <laughs> I was going to say there, well done, Taft Toulouse. I was just going to say, does anyone recognise... Uh, hang on, hopefully this is going to come up. This is weird now, she's really laggy tonight for some reason. Oh, that's no good, is it? Uh, that one. <laughs> I just showed you the wrong screen. <clears throat> I was going to say, does anyone recognise that chap there? That uh, interesting looking young man, that is, uh, that is uh, Mr. Fomenko. Mr. Fomenko, who's uh, sort of, well, his name on the front of the covers, where you look at a lot of these Russian research books. He's like the poster boy. He does it all with maths and stats, and it's all good stuff. But we won't be going to any of that, really. Well, we go into some of the work, Fomenko's work, but not the stats side of it. <clears throat> Unless you really want me to, which I doubt anyone does. Oh, hello, Harrywood. Good to see you again as well. <coughs> Gosh, my voice, what's happened? I was fine. This is suddenly going all croaky. Right, loads of people online. Brilliant. <coughs> right, okay, let's go through. Um, so much to get through. I want to do it really quickly because I want to have a good chat about the main thing later. And we've got some other f fun things to look at as well. Right, where do we start? At the beginning, says he. Okay, but where's the beginning? Right, so you can see... Okay, let's check cats coming through. How are we doing for lag arts? Bits? Oh, not too bad. Oh, not too bad. Seconds. Okay, so there you go. Wilson of Black, it nailed it. It's going to be the main thing. I'm going to go through that. Uh, it's just great. It's just great. Uh, you'll have an idea already. But well, I've been looking more and more because I've been working at, um, looking at Wilson of Black, it's books. In particular, Moses and the Hieroglyphs. And King Arthur Conspiracy, of course, which are very related in some respects. But particularly at the ancient stuff, 
and I've been reading a lot about um, the Fomenko new chronology. I'm not getting into all the Tartarian stuff and all that. I'll go into reasons why and why not. Uh, what they do do is a very good analysis of ancient history, timelines, chronologies. And they talk in there about how messed up these timelines are, particularly Western history, particularly things like Greek history, Roman history, mainstream version of English history. And the more I read it, I keep going back to it, the more I think, hey, if you people would read Wilson and Blackett, they would answer a lot of the questions and problems that you put forward. These anomalies that don't make sense, they do make sense. And the way in which I describe it is that uh, if you've actually got a jigsaw, and this is the jigsaw of time and history, and what these uh, Russian scientists, and it's a massive team of them, it's a real Soviet push, which is why I'm a bit suspicious about some of the Tartarian stuff. But that's another thing which I will get on to. You take this, you show that this jigsaw has been smashed up and the pieces are all in the wrong order and there's too many pieces okay. and all that kind of stuff. So therefore what they do is more or less bin it and say this is just rubbish, this is our new theory. Whereas, <clears throat> I'll say what Wilson and Blackett do, they take all those pieces and they put them all together correctly so you can see the picture again, okay? Oh, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Right, okay, a few things to go through first. <clears throat> Oh, I hope Mummy's listening. Get me a cup of tea or something. Right, uh, here we go. Welsh history stories. Okay. So, uh, this is where I have to change screens. So, I have to show me just for a second. <coughs> yeah, the new channel, is it's uh, it's up. It's not exactly... You're going to watch a historic moment. So, there we go. I was going to do... Oh, I was going to do a quick um, trivia then, wasn't I? <laughs> That's right. Uh, just watch the comments, Arnie. I want to see how many people know who... All the people are across the top here in this new channel. Uh, you can see who's that in the wheelchair. <clears throat> you can see the bridge behind. I think everyone knows the bridge. Who's this chap? Wilson and Blackett fans. Followers of this channel should definitely know who that is. Probably won't know who this is because I'm not sure either. <laughs> That's not really why the picture's there. What is this? Who is she? Who is she? It's my little quiz, right? We'll come back to this later. Ah, oh, thank you, Angela. I'll suddenly come round all croaky and what happened. But it could have been his following Arnie's rugby match this morning, which is very exciting. The big local rivals, and I digress slightly. We live in their area, ironically, after all the things I say about the fact that Tlanis did uh, vow down on the south coast where the universities were, you know, the first, possibly the first university in the world. And you got the early church set up by Ifthid, or even earlier by Ilid in the first century, and how it's Clan Ifthid, <coughs> and this abomination they give it of Lantwit Vardra. Well, of course, we've got a top on. Oh, yeah, we've got a rugby top on. He's got the tracksuits on. Our local rugby team is is Lantwit Vardra, as opposed to sorry, Lantwit Major, is the one on the south coast. So, after saying how terrible it is to call him Lantwit. We're all there going, come on, lads, it! <laughs> Which is the ultimate irony, really. Although, having spent more time with uh, Lawrence, he's got Ifthid as the bad guy. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And the, the Lay Hunter thing. I've had to remember to get everything in. There's so much I might forget. All right, so there's a new channel. And uh, if you're not aware of it, uh, this is separate to Britain's Hidden History. You've realised this new history book come out. There is no Welsh history in it. It's a very twisted and bitter version of Wales. It's really not very nice. And I realised that, uh, well, not just young people, but um, most people uh, are not being passed on the old stories. These are stuff that used to be passed generation after generation after generation. A lot of them are in books like this. Hang on, give you a chance to, oops, sorry, give you a chance to see that a bit better. Welsh stories... Stories from Welsh history, um, <clears throat> which I'm not sure exactly when this book is from. I get the feeling reading it is probably 1930s, because there's no mention of World War II in it, and there is a mention of World War One, so it kind of narrows it down a bit. But there's no publishing date, which annoys me with history books when they do that. I'm sure I could find out. But what's happening is these stories are not getting passed on. So let's look on their comments. Is that Barry John? <laughs> close, close. 
You want to swap your 10 for a 9. Anyway, but not today. So Arnie's team, Lantwit. Clanifted Vowed, we should call ourselves. Come on, Clanifted. I'm lying that Clanifted. It's not quite as easy as go on, Lantwit. But there we are. We should do, really. And they're playing the local rivals, Bather. Which is also interesting, ties in uh, with how much history there is in this area. Because the proper Welsh is actually Urbather, as in the graves, rather than just graves. Yes, I went to a school uh, called The Graves, and so does Arnie. That's where the school is. Anyway, I, I found a new verb this morning, and that's the verb to nil someone. N-I-L. <coughs> that's when they don't score a single point, which is what they did to be there. They nilled them. Okay, so anyway, what this is going to be about, it's just, there's only one up so far. Little six-minute, seven-minute videos. Uh, please pass these stories on, whether it's school children, all ages, just the history stories. You're going to watch history now because this is going to be the first subscribe. But if you have to do, just go along and hit that subscribe button. Ta da! First subscriber. <laughs> so if you're quick, you could be in the first 10. It'd be interesting to see how many subscribers we get by the end of the show. There's no views, That's, no subscribers. You're forgetting something. Remember to. Turn oh, oh, I'm, thank you, Arnie. Yes, all notifications. And notifications. I hope you're doing that with Britain's Hidden History. Now, every time a video goes up, and there's going to be lots, as you'll see. Uh, okay, so that's what this is going to be about. And I've given everyone a chance to have a quick go at it. I'll never remember to come back at the end of the night, so I'll run through them quickly. That's Tiny Gray Thompson. Comes from near here. Oh, oh which oh. do you do? You're just in time. Oh, Tiny Gray, yeah, very good. Tanny. Near enough. Go on, I'm going to one more go with... Uh, so that's Tanny Gray Thompson. Uh, see, like, probably the greatest Paralympic athlete. Won loads and loads of medals. All distances, sprinting, right up to marathons. And Imagine. then the bridge in the background, I'm sure you'll all recognise that. This is not Welsh tonight, by the way. The next two stories are, well, that's about the last mention of Wales tonight. Apart from one more, one more, Gwynedd. And then we've got the Pontypris Bridge behind it, which is the longest single span bridge in the world back in the 1770s when it was built. I'm sure everyone on this channel knows this character. Have any guesses on who he is? Oh, I don't know. No one's getting that one. I think you do. That's Tudrig. King Todrig, the one built at Mathern, and that's the stained glass window of him at Landuff. Uh, do you recognise this one? This lady is actually blocking one of the points. Uh, hopefully, at the right Cromlech. It's a Cromlech. No I'm pretty sure because I can see what's in the background. No what? one's got that one yet. No one's got that one either. I'm going to leave these up a little bit longer, oh, I the think. Stones, but not the woman. I thought people would get the stones. And the lady here, this is a bit of fun really, isn't it? But these are the kind of stories that will be in the new channel. She's got no shoes on, which is the, the big clue as to who that is. I'm just curious to know if people know these stories at all. Uh, maybe not. Anyway, there's a very st famous story, Mary Jones and her Bible. And she lived, she was a devout Christian, came from a Methodist family, but she could not get a Welsh Bible. So uh, eventually she walked 20 odd miles to Bethesda, I think, near Bala Lake, and uh, to buy a Bible. When she got there, couldn't get one. Uh, but the person gave her a special copy, and that's how the Bible movement started and all this. Very important story. Great stuff. And this one here. That one's obvious. My hero. Who's that on? Gareth Edwards. Gareth Edwards. Well done, yes. This should have been a Christmas quiz, shouldn't it? Been good fun. They recognise this thing, the engine, the locomotive, oh, I should call it. Tough. <laughs> Trevethic, Trevethic. You'd have got there eventually. And there's the old. Another person, Taff, something got it. What? Oh, someone got it. Oh, Taffy Ducks, probably. No, I reckon no. Taffy Ducks would have got them all. Are you going to let me know if someone gets them? Yeah. Alright, anyway, just let you know. So that channel is coming up. The link is already in the description. So you can go on there, hit Taff subscribe, Taff. start watching the videos, okay? And please, please pass them on. Everyone should know these stories. They're um, it's a bit of sport. The video's all going to be six or seven minutes. None of this discussion, nothing, well, nothing I would call controversial. Not the sort of stuff we're going to do tonight when we're taking history apart. Just little stories, okay? Oh, hang on, here has Mary Jones in a Bible. I put it up there. <coughs> and that's how the British and Foreign Bible Society was started. Very important. So it's all on Wikipedia. I had a little look earlier just to make sure I wasn't talking nonsense. <laughs> Not Bala. Bala it was, 26 miles away. Um, and it's near Cadder Idris, which you're going to see a bit more of in a second. All right, okay. Excuse me, bouncing around. So that's that's going to be up. 
And these are easy to do. A lot of them I'm going to read straight from the book, for example. It's not like uh, groundbreaking research or anything, okay? This is just stories that generation after generation after generation were passed down. I was think I was taught all of these by my parents, rather than school, I might add. So it's our duty to pass them on to our children, okay? Anyway, here we go. This one, right, which I did a video a couple of days ago. I wasn't very well last week, so there's only the one video. And I'm still a bit... i got this weird thing in my ear where I can't hear. And this one balanced me and I felt a bit dizzy. But I feel okay now. I feel good. I just can't hear very well. Which means, uh, in some ways, it's good. You have this kind of silence, which is... Uh, I don't think it's a permanent deafness, don't worry. It's just something that's... Um, one of these winter things. But uh, so if I sound a bit strange or I'm shouting or trying too hard, then uh, that's probably what it is because I can't hear myself very well, okay? But it's it's fine apart from that. Right. I did a video on this during the week. Um, again, you can read the full story. All right, let's go and do the full story a second. Uh, <laughs> uh, golly gee, I'm so organized this week. Uh, I, you've probably seen the video, so I'll do this very quickly. But the great thing is it could rewrite the idea of London's history, all right? Because not only have they found coins in this uh, on the south bank of London, they've also found Iron Age. It's pre-Roman, all right? Pre-Roman. Shields, helmets, all sorts. The helmet, which anyone would say normally is a Viking helmet, can't be, <laughs> if the Vikings ever existed anyway, but that's another story. So what we're saying, isn't it great that we got this stuff and it's pre-Roman, including coins. And it's signs of trade and commerce and all this kind of stuff, all right? So that's all looking good. Anything else should we read, Nero? Uh, have you heard something you don't want to hear? <laughs> no, I haven't heard anything much this week, so it's great. Oh, Taffy Ducks. Uh, pardon? Oh, he's leaving them for everyone else. Yeah, Taffy Ducks should have got all those. <laughs> right. Uh, so anyway, the point of this was... It was like, hooray, we are making uh, progress. So thank you, Mandy McCourt, for finding that. A couple of other people have posted it. Peter and things. So thank you as well. And then, um, yeah, keep sending me stuff, which you see. But you think you're making progress because saying, yeah, not everything's Roman and obviously it's pre-Roman. And then Mandy found this. And this comes up. And you're right back to square one again. Honestly, it's amazing. And it's all to do with this um, digging for Britain, I think it's called. Uh, Miss Roberts, the archaeologist. I don't know what stories I'm getting here. I'm getting These news stories keeps running because I had it open earlier. That's what's happened there. Anyway, this story I'll do another short video on. There's a settlement in Somerset. They say it took six years to get to Somerset for the, the, the Romans. But what's absolutely amazing about this is they found... Please read this article. It is that they've got a, a, an unbroken uh, timeline going back hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, and they can show us. It's way, way older than the Roman period. There's loads of stuff. Isn't it fantastic? People living there doing all this kind of stuff. And the key thing about it is where they do the extracting the lead. And there's a process how they do it. Uh, and then... Look at this, a stunning insight to the life they lived 2,000 years ago, and it goes all the way back. But then, bizarrely, it all gets called Roman anyway. It's just so weird. It's like, um... Yeah, how can pre-Roman still be Roman? Yeah, yeah, it's all pre-Roman. They even talk about the Foss Way, which is, you know, lots of evidence that's pre-Roman. <laughs> the whole idea, because my question is, where the lot... Yeah, go on. Just, look, just looking at the related articles... Related articles, yeah, That's North Korean missile really attack. How on earth does that work? I've no idea. No, I don't look like him. <laughs> no, there's the... <laughs> <laughs> Macintosh added, the people living here, they're not directly lead miners. They're living too well for that. So they own the lead mines? I mean, why? if they're not there for the lead, why would the earlier British settlement be there? Makes no sense to me. You think you're making progress. Now everything goes back to being uh, there. We are. So there's a comment that said here: "Unbroken this instance means a continuous settlement, without abandonment and resettlement. So layer upon layer of settlement life until it's actually abandonment." All right. Thank you for the comment. Better informed than most of the article. The point is, 
There's no sign of it being attacked or burnt down or a conflict or anything to say the Romans went there at all. And it's just made into uh, Roman. So yeah, we go one step forward, two steps back. But I still think this year will be the great breakthrough year, okay? So thank you, Mandy, for that one and that one in the description. Aha! <laughs> yeah, don't go blank on me. I'm trying to remember what this video is. Couple, I've got a couple of short videos to show. Hang on, which one's this? This is the story oh, yes. of King Arthur of the Britons. A country riven by war. The boy king must deal with intrigue, invading foreign armies, lead in mighty battles, and inspire a nation to become as one. For this is no mere legend. This is the historic King Arthur. Right. Now, I have read most of that book and recorded it. Almost finished it, didn't we? We've done some other books as well. We need to get back to this one. But then, um, this I haven't shown this video actually to push the book. <laughs> All the recordings, which I'm going to load more and more and more of them up. You'll find a playlist for Arthur the Walking. No, the reason I showed this is is for the uh, Arthur the Play. Or Arthur, it might be a musical. I've written a couple of songs for it. And uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, music running through the whole piece. A refrain, I think the technical term is. I don't know. I'm not trained in music at all. I just come up with tunes and jot. And same with writing a play. But I've shown a couple of people now the synopsis. Uh, the basic stories. It's about eight or nine scenes with a um, halfway cut. And it covers, really is focused on the first year of Arthur's kingship. So when he's 15, 16. And all the things he goes through. And there's a lot of politics and twists and... You got the love triangle. The whole thing's in there, okay? And we want to do this play. That's going to be a, a. See, my worry with musical is might become a bit my fair lady, you know. Uh, imagine that, that's not a bad example. That's fairly serious in a way, isn't it? Uh, but I don't want to belittle it. There's been enough humiliating and everything of the Arthur stories, the Arthur history. So it's a serious look at the Welsh historical King Arthur and what he did in his first year. That struggle he must have had for a 15-year-old boy to suddenly become the Uther Pendrag and the High General, what he'd have had to go through to assert himself. Um, so that's all, all done. Apart from uh, more dialogue, which I think would be uh, possibly improvised. Hopefully the restrictions would come down in Wales, because the best theatre for this would be the one in Brecon, which holds, uh, perhaps Johnny Nigney could put on the comments what the capacity is, Looked about 300 to me, maybe 350. I think we could fill that a couple of nights. It'd be great. So I'd like to do Brecon's on. Uh, you can get a train to Brecon, I think. I better check this. But I want people to have some feedback. What do they think about Brecon as a venue? Because what I would thought would be good to do as uh, chatting with Steve Pole and Bob Morgan, trying to bend Johnny's arm a little bit, is the... Um, It'd be nice to have a two or three day conference where we all get together and use the stage area for most of it, if not all of it. Then we could do presentations, different people. There's so much good stuff going on, they could do that. And then we could have the big play Saturday night. Something like that, that's kind of ideas I'm toying around with. As well as in June, not far away, <laughs> I need to organise this, where there's going to be a birthday party for Alan Wilson in Newcastle. So things are happening, all right? Look out for the play as well. Oh, yeah, I need to get a cast together. That's the other thing. I remember now. Um, I thought I was going to work. <laughs> it's a bit like um, I'm going on Martin Leeker's... I'm doing a couple of speaking engagements with Martin Leeker, who's organising his tour. So thank you very much for that invite, Mart Martin. I'm looking forward to that. That'd be cool. And if anyone else... I love going out to meet people. Um, doing things live, it's great. It, this is... This, you know, we build our network, get to know each other. Brilliant, okay? So, more ideas on that, please. Uh, oh, yeah, it does also remind me that... This is my hand a second ago. King Arthur Conspiracy Book. What? Oh, I've just used it to put the microphone on. <laughs> <laughs> just shoot me now. Uh, all the chapters are in bar one, so you know who you are. Um, if you can't do it, you haven't got time, don't worry, send it back. So, it's almost all done. Uh I've also got Peter's doing all the graphics because there's loads in here about how to read. I'll do more on this next week, okay? Because the book should be going on pre-sale next week. So it'll be a good time to talk about it. How, how to read Colburn, Etruscan, 
Phrygian, all these kind of things. It's all in there. All with the ancient migrations. That's volume one. Volume two will come out at the same time. And that's going to be the thematic journeys and the American connections. And how you can read the cave art there and everything. <clears throat> so both are as important. All right. Uh, the Lay Hunters. If you're not aware of this, uh, please get yourself a copy. Or sign up for it. Um, contact me. I'm not even sure. I must have a website or something. But uh, the main editor of this is uh, Lawrence. Oops, sorry, it's a note to me from Lawrence. And he doesn't do internet and TVs and things. <laughs> so uh, you have to send a letter, perhaps. That's what I did. Well, I actually went there as well. So uh, it's really good. Loads of stuff about stones, ley lines, uh, history. Uh, it's mostly, it's not particularly Welsh, by the way. It's all over Britain. So uh, hopefully that's of interest to people. And that note on there, thank you very much from Lawrence, was, uh, well, I'll read it to you. <laughs> Let's dream and go on a pilgrimage soon. And I will be. So probably the end of next month, end of Feb, uh, we're going to be up um, some cold, miserable hill, uh, trying to get some sleep so we can dream, okay? Like uh, Kyra Ingley, I think, is favourite for that. But uh, Lawrence in charge, because it's all to do with uh, times of the month and well the times of the calendar I should say and that fits in with different locations and their special qualities all right so there's a lot this oh, is... you already watched this right okay this is good news as well I don't have a copy in my hand but uh, uh, Hugh's come through great sent me a whole box full of these which we're going to be selling at a discount and it's going to be 19.99 so we're going to be selling them at 14.99 for the first 42 copies I've got so if you're first 42, you can get one of those at the discounted price. Right, I'm just going to show you quickly, because this week, I know we promised it the last couple of weeks, but we've nailed it in. We're going to be talking tomorrow morning to get more videos done supporting the book, which uh, the scenery, if nothing else, watch it for the scenery. It's absolutely stunning. We were so lucky. We went up to Gwynedd and the sun shone. It was glorious. It was just great. Brilliant sunsets. Um, so, you know, just watch it for the scenery. Even, I'll show you a couple of little bits of what it's all about. And while I was up there, I just stopped. Uh, I think this is... When I stick my neck out, I'm pretty sure that's Camlan. And in the background... Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's Camlan. And this is the pass where uh, Arthur would have fought his last battle with Maudred. It's also an important part of the Zodiac. Because they're... The twin curves look like this, which is where we get the bull's horns from. So I asked Hugh a quick question then. Uh, why, why did he do all this? What's it all about? So what made you think of this? I mean, it's an amazing sight. It's such a vast scale and the horns of Taurus oh, and everything. What, what made him. you come up? Oh, no. <laughs> this idea. I can't. Disappointing video when you can't see it. Hmm. Let's go back to the beginning. How do I go back to the beginning? Right, Arnie, I press three. Can everyone see it? No, four. No, we cannot. Still two. two okay, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I think it's two. We still can't see. No, it's four, it. isn't it? There we go. Yeah. Oh. Right. Sorry about that, folks. Try again. So, what made you think of this? I mean, it's an amazing sight. It's such a vast scale and the Why horns of Taurus and everything. What, what made you come up? Come across this idea? This could be it. Right. Sorry, folks. Just going to. Uh, well, the horns of gremlins here. Can hear the wind in the mic. Right, hang on a second. Ah, oh, what a muppet! <laughs> People who've been following this channel from the beginning know it's not this. This wouldn't be the same without a few mishaps on this front. Right, we shall try again. Uh, <laughs> stay calm, Ross. It's cool. Right, three, wasn't it? Three, four, four. Just on the screen share, you can see me. Well, that's two. Yeah, I'm just wondering if that'd be better. Oh! Maybe it's because in PowerPoint. And it's a bit I know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we'll just do it on two then. There we are. And I'll press it like that. So what made you think of this? I mean, it's an amazing sight. It's such a vast scale. And the horns of Taurus and everything. What, what made you come, up, come across this idea? This could be it. 
Well, um, the the whole sort of idea grew around the centre of the star maps, which is uh, at Polaris, which is over there, uh, at Cader Idris, which is where I started my research because that's where my family were from and in, in, in that area. And um, once you establish the centre and then establish the uh, ecliptic being the rivers, um, the, the features on the ground are named to correspond to the various constellations. So we're standing in this valley here. On either side are these two ranges of mountains that curve around. And if you look at them from the map, they look like the horns of a bull. And they are actually named as... Um, one of the, one of the uh, mountains is called Pen y Bryn Forchog, which means the prong which is the, the point, the prongs of, of the bull. So these mountains are named to reflect the constellation. And there's a lot of, a lot of work um, trying to identify them and translate them and correlate them with the, um, with the constellations. But that's how it's done. And that's, um, that's how you identify where the constellations are. And every time you do it, it has to match with the previous work you've done. And if it doesn't, then you have to go back and start again. And ultimately, you have a complete story that uh, that supports every every facet supports the other facets. And then uh, you know that that's uh, a, a substantial hypothesis. At least I hope so. Uh, it's, it is excellent, and as you can see, and if you watch this channel at all, uh, you'll know that Hugh's. Um, uh, Great talker. <laughs> it's just a natural at doing this. Uh, so this is just a um, drawing from the book that uh, Hugh sent me here. So you can go through all these other different constellations. You can go through them all, find where they all are. The book explains them all to you. And um, I'll put the first video up, uh, <clears throat> hopefully tomorrow, maybe day after. You see where we, we met up. We went around quite a few. We couldn't do all of them, but we spent two, three days. And here's one I want to talk about. This is up on the northwest coast of Wales. There's Draco. You see the star maps. And what's amazing, you'll find from... The, this is where the videos come in handy. The videos doing this week. Is you visit these places and you can see the names. Like the farm we stayed at is the, the um, oh, something of the stars. And that's where the Milky Way passes. It's it's just brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And there's one, um, I'll show you this, is a little stone circle. And you'll see us go to the stone circle. It's still there. It's just around the back of some houses. No one's taking any notice. It's ridiculous. And I'm just going to show you this. I'll just give you an idea just how stunning uh, some, of the, some of the views are and the sunsets and stuff. Please work. Down, so sort of like little uh, niche and then the winter sun Sorry, sets the over on this side and the sun through the course of the year uh, goes down between that part of the land where it meets the water and that part of the land where it meets the water the sun sets across that width of ocean from this location Yeah, so that's the theme piece over there in distance. So, uh, we're actually up near Cader Idris. And of course there'll be moon sets as well. And what he explains uh, in the videos and his book is the idea is that the, the, the join, if you like, between the spiritual world comes in in the Milky Way along the theme. Sorry, the Milky Way is more to do with the rivers, but you watch, watch the, the flow through the countryside and uh, from Hugh Gadarn, Hugh, <laughs> like Hugh, up on his big seat, up on Cader Idris, the, the chair of Idris, sorry, the great, I'm messing it up a bit. I'll leave, it, I'll leave the details for the videos. But Cader is a key point, and from there you can look and you can watch the stars revolving. You can see the Milky Way flowing, flowing through the various rivers. It, it's 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 mind-blowingly good. And like I say, you'll see some stunning stunning landscapes uh and we were lucky with the weather as well so look out for those Down. okay we just, right. oh, we just saw that right okay 
How are we doing for time? Yes, perfect. Right, we'll jump in and uh, yeah, jumping a little bit deep end with Herodotus there. Sounds very serious, doesn't it? We get these names out like Herodotus and stuff. All I'm going to do is come at it slightly differently. Hang on a second. Uh, no, I need to be back here, don't I? How am I going to jump between the two? Because I also want to show you what's on there. Right, okay, we'll come back to him. Okay. Right, what we're going to look at now, the big thing here, and I'm going to draw heavily on Fomenko. Uh, it, it says Fomenko, I don't know why he gets all the credit, really, Anatoly Fomenko. If you read it, there's teams and teams of mathematicians and scientists. I'm not pushing this work, I don't get anything for it. Um... They're big books, <laughs> six or seven, and they're all huge. But what I like about these books is the vast amounts of references. I think this one claims 20,000 references or some thousands, some crazy number. And they have this huge team doing research. Now, I'll just give a quick background to the overall philosophy that they're pushing. They are... Uh, the overall situation, they say, is that this whole extended Western history is a construct. And you've got the uh, Scaligerian chronology. So you've got, uh, we talked about him before, uh, Scaliger was uh, 17th century, 16th century monk. And he's the first one who created this sort of ladder, like ladder here. And you could hook things on, they, each step of the ladder being different dates. So he's the one who more or less decided that I don't know Alexander the Great was 322 BC and uh, the Romans first attacked Britain in 55 BC and all these dates go all the way through. Now, what I'm not going to go into is their main thesis, which is that this is all nonsense and that it's been massively extended and it's a, it's a, it's a fiction. Whether it's done deliberately or accidentally, the overall scheme... But what's bizarre, and this is where Wilson and Blackett would agree as well, is that this was the work more or less of a person with very limited resources. He was persecuted. There's a lot of Christ a lot of religious battling going on. He moved around. All he had was his books. Obviously, very intelligent. He could do Latin stuff like this, and he's done the chronology, and it's just stuck, which is weird in itself. Uh, what Fomenko and his team argue, is that the whole thing needs a thousand years taken out of it straight away. And that, uh, say, Jesus, for example, would have been around about a th what we would call a thousand AD. So what we do, so what we call it now, um, oh, let's pretend it's 1980s. <laughs> it makes it easier to do all the X's and everything. So 1980 would be 980. And the X that we see represents the crucifixion rather than a hundred years. This is, well, very crude. I'm doing a really crude job on this. I'm not disparaging their theory or anything. I'm just not going particularly into that. What they, What's very curious about their work, if you're not familiar with it, is they say a lot of this uh, was created as a false memory because the real history, from their perspective, was there was this huge uh, well, Genghis Khan, effectively, uh, conquered the world and a lot of our stories that we have in uh, history are actually retellings of Genghis Khan stories, uh, but changed to uh, a Western setup, and the dates all changed. And you say this is quite recent. So that's quite a heavy thing, and that's I'm sure there's other channels out there, and uh, people can study that, because I haven't really looked at all that side of it. All right, I'll be straight up. It's six, seven volumes. I've read a lot of it. I have no way claim to be an expert in that. What is interesting, though, to make their argument, the first thing they do is they break down how the chronology and history that we all learn at school and accept as just what history is, how it's so badly uh, flawed, how it's based on assumptions and mistakes. And in some cases, as we'll see here, I like to uh, dig into it a bit, uh, actual fraud. <laughs> no, it sounds uh, a bit crazy. It sounds like conspiracy theory. But before I get to that side of it, 
what I really want to talk about is the, the dating of ancient Egypt as well. All right. So we're not going to go into the whole Tartarian thing. That's for other people to talk about. Uh, <laughs> we'll see how far we get. Okay. This could take a couple of uh, talks, but some big ideas are very important because they do tie in extremely well with what Wilson and Blackett write. And the one area I would say that uh, Fomenko is pretty weak, because I bought book four. I do have some others on PDS, which I was going to share with you. Uh, or at least share excerpts, whatever copyright allows, of course. This deals with British history as well. Unfortunately, they seem totally unaware and oblivious of British or Welsh history. And it's just done from a sort of English perspective. Um, as in Anglo-Saxons, Norman invasion, Romans. So they're, well, what's fascinating, they take the same history that we dismantle when we're showing how a lot of this can be faked or not, not correct. They do the same thing and they do it the advantages of huge amounts of research and references. And they use statistics where they look at, uh, they, they, take apart the idea of looking at eclipses and astronomy to show how a lot of it's bunkum, basically. So they, from that point of view, it's very, very connected to what we're doing. And as I say, if they think they, they're telling you this jigsaw's all wrong, I wish they'd read Wilson and Blackett and he would tell them how to put the jigsaw back together in the right way. So a little bit of background. I'd love to see what the comments are on this. Yeah. So just, just turn a little bit so I can have a look. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, people talking about the zodiacs and stuff. All right, that's cool. Right, okay, so right, this is I want to put oh, him on 143 screen. Watching. What? 143 watching. Live. Wow, <laughs> it's a record. 143 watching. <laughs> it's a record by 100. I think. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Right, okay, so Herodotus, I put this page up from Wikipedia just to show how important this guy is. All right. So I'll just read off there. An ancient Greek writer, geographer, and historian, born in the Greek city of Halicarnassus, blah, 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 where he's from. Um, his histories cover the lives of prominent kings, the famous battles, all the main things from history. But what is key is Herodotus is considered the father, the father, the founder of what we today would call um, history. The first real historian, okay? So it's, uh, he's very important. Hang on. Uh, oh, just lost my track a bit then. Uh, right, okay. No, stay there. <laughs> stay there, Ross. Stay there, stay there, stay there. Now, the, the first question is, he's supposed to have written in 484 BC, 425 BC. And I have gone through this. And what we'll find in here is, we'll come back to him in a second. Did this person even exist, or in that period anyway, or is it actually someone in the Renaissance times writing this? And it's key, because he's at the centre of all this, uh, as important as Scaliger. Now, to tie this back into Wilson and Blackett, an example that we can all follow and check and look for is how remarkably similar a lot of what they write is to the contents of Moses in the Hieroglyphs. And I'll show you now. All right, so this is from Fomenko, New Chronology, Volume 1, page 24. This is where I need a bigger desk. Oop. Can you put that somewhere, please? Yes. And I need me specs. Anyway, I can, but I need some space. Oh, no. What have I done with my specs? <laughs> I've taken my specs off. Yeah. I need to ask me to get me a pair of glasses, please. Yeah. Right, okay. Anyway, I'll show you this now. Right, first of all, these dates, when they talk about the ascension of Menes, what they're referring to here is effectively the start of Egyptology. The beginning of the first uh, dynasty, the first pharaohs. When do you date them from? How far back do we go on this timeline? And this is quite shocking. These are the German scientists. You might know some of them in my book, Cameroclyphics, and in Mo Moses. Uh, Bruch has mentioned quite a bit who he was. Bunsen's mentioned quite a bit. Bunsen's the one who talks about the ancient languages. Look at this range of dates. There's over 2,000 years difference between when Boke thinks this happened 
And when Bunsen thinks it happened. Over 2,000 years? I mean, it's just amazing. And then uh, the French, like Champollion and all these people who get the real credit for uh, being the experts on Egyptology and cracking the hieroglyphs, all that. It's just as bad. Here's the French scientists. They call them scientists. I think we put it, it's a Russian thing. Uh, by the way, the writing of this book is... Um, it's really interesting style. It's it's written like a, an academic book written, I would say, in the nineteen twenties. <laughs> it's like this beautiful, old fashioned, very precise style of English, and, and very correct and very um, extensive vocabulary. You know, it's a very interesting read if you like that kind of thing. I I I do. <laughs> I think a lot of people would find it uh, quite dry. So here we go. So there's Champollion. He's at five eight six seven. Oh, thank you, Arnie. Save me there. So he's saying that um, uh, the the pharaohs, if you like, began what's that? Including today's two thousand uh, years, seven thousand eight hundred, so more or less eight thousand years ago. Whereas Palmer down here, we're looking at about four thousand years ago. I mean, the distances are staggering. They're absolutely staggering. Uh, the differences of opinion over this which shows just how unprecise or imprecise the whole thing is right now where does all this dating come from this is where it gets interesting now okay so I want to show that because Wilson and Blackett talk about all these things in here and they've been ridiculed and rubbish for it and you go in there and I'm reading it again thinking my goodness this is all this is all the same this is the same stuff and Wilson and Black had never heard of these because I, I introduced them to Fomenko a couple of years ago. It was new to them. And I'm pretty sure Fomenko hasn't heard of Wilson and Black because if he had, he could answer a lot of the questions he asks. Right, now Herodotus, <clears throat> I'm not going to go through him tonight, but it's the same thing there, just quickly. <clears throat> I'll give you an idea. Herodotus creates confusion in chronology in Egypt. He says uh, the person they wrongly call Ramses II was a king of the 19th dynasty, which ran to 1200 BC, whereas Cheops belonged to the 4th dynasty, which is uh, about 1,500 years early. So there's a 1,200-year discrepancy, because these are supposed to be continuous people. It's, it's a mess. <clears throat> and what you realise when you look more and more into it, and Wilson and Black have done, is all our history becomes a mess. Now, the other thing they do is to show the dating of a lot of this is very important, because it underpins how we date everything and one of the things they show is the founding of rome which come on to another time and how the only way that can work amazingly is if you it's either a complete lie or you move the fall of troy forward by 500 years again something done by wilson and blackett by their own um independent research all right getting back to these guys and the scam we see I want to talk about this is the main character all right this good, trustworthy looking soul is called uh, Poggio. And the story is with Poggio is that he. Uh, hang on, where's he gone? Sorry. It does jump around in these books. You need a lot of different markers and things. I'm going to have to do this from memory so I can't find the right bits now. I don't want to keep everyone waiting. Right, so what Poggio. Hang on one second. I want to get the right way around because you got Poggio Bracciolini, which is this guy. Right. He is the one which Fomenko accuse of really writing the works of Tacitus. He, he's the writer, not Tacitus himself. But they're written in Renaissance times. These are Renaissance stories, okay? Now, the people who wrote about this are called Hockart and Ross. They did a lot of statistical analysis, they looked at what he'd done, and they worked out that he was the writer because there's many references in there to things which would not have been known to ancient writers. So immediately we started to pick them apart. You got the same as Cicero, and his partner in crime for all this here was this other person. Oop, I'm going to show you about him in a second. Uh, when you come on to his. Oh dear, not as fluent as usual tonight, Ross. I think I'm fully well this week. Uh, Yes, we got Bracciolini. It's all these Italian names, all right? I will jump out of there a second to show you, make this a little bit easier. All right. 
So if we go to uh, Wikipedia, get an idea when these people were. So we're talking quite early, 1380-1459. So that's his full name, Gian Francesco Poggio Bracciolini, Italian scholar, early Renaissance humanist. Now this is the bit. He was responsible for rediscovering and recovering many classical Latin manuscripts. Right, so this is the key. And this is bizarre. They were decaying and forgotten in German, Swiss, and French monastic libraries. All these works he found. All right, and his partner in crime, as it were, uh, Niccolo de Niccoli, as the other one's trying to remember the name of. Um, he was the partner in crime in this, and they were they were running what seems to be a bit of a scam. Now, if you look at it, what's amazing, they actually got uh, busted on a couple of occasions. This is the crazy things about it. Uh, one of the great uh, uh, forgeries they did was blown open, and they had to backtrack very quickly. Now, I'm trying to build a big story here, because what we, the situation we've got is they were tied in with um, the bankers of the time. And they needed a history and they needed a story. And what I think has happened here is this actually ties in with the church as well. I think they're all in on this together. I don't give an idea of the money they're making. You'd find one of these ancient uh, manuscripts. One manuscript alone was sold. It was enough to buy a palace with servants. We're talking huge sums of money. And what would happen, he'd come along, or Nikolai de Nikoli, uh, let's look there. So let's read this. He was born and died in Florence, where the Medicis were, the bankers, which gathered round the patronage of, art of good old Cosimo de' Medici, right? So Nicolai's chief services to classical literature consisted in his work as a copyist and collator of ancient manuscripts. He corrected the text, introduced divisions into chapters, and made tables of contents. That's the official version. That's the official mainstream, it's everything's good, nothing to see here version. First thing that strikes me is poor old uh, um, Yolo Morganu, because <laughs> he was copying manuscripts from only a few hundred years before, and he left an immaculate record in his diaries and his notes where he got the papers from, who provided them, when he copied them, and he would find the same stories in different houses. Because at the time, uh, the Welsh history or British history was being persecuted and rich families had private collections of books, which they kept very quiet about. And he just walked around the houses, copying them, making notes where he came from. These guys didn't do any of that. <laughs> this is the amazing thing. You start to look into it, it's quite mind-blowing because they would say, uh, what else is he saying here? Uh, there we are, I see. Right, here we go. The pursuit of ancient manuscripts. This isn't from Fomenko now, right? This is the official mainstream narrative. Was a dangerous and expensive task. Agents working in the field at the time included Poggio Bracciolini, the last guy I showed. And thanks to the patronage of the Domicis, Nikolai was able to build up his personal library of 800 manuscripts. He was generous with lending out his books since he had multiple copies. This goes on and on and on. So this, the situation you have is that when they would go to these places, what do they call them? Uh, let's go back to this guy. Da, 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 da. Quite often they would be in decaying, you know, mostly de uh, decaying and forgotten in German, Swiss and French monastic libraries. Now, bear in mind the dates, okay? We're looking at uh, 13s to 1400s. The papers, which are supposedly sitting there rotting, are from, well, at the latest, 300. So over a thousand years old. And they've been sitting, apparently decaying, up in these libraries, like up in Germany and places like that. Always, always a long way away from Italy. Always a long way from where anyone could check. And the story gets worse. Because what they would do, they would go up and say, all right, we just found uh, Tacitus, for example, or Pliny, uh, Euclides, all these kind of things. The same with the Greek stuff, by the way. Going to go on to the Greek stuff. 
The same with Archimedes and all these mathematicians, all this great ancient learned Greek stuff, all comes from the same sort of sources. There are no ancient sources. I've been talking to some academics about this and some book people. They're claiming there's one fragment of Tacitus from 900 uh, AD, which even that would put it, you know, about a thousand years after the event. And even that's extremely flaky. <laughs> flaky physically, because it's falling apart, there's only a bit of it. And the dating, I would say, is flaky as well. Right. So what, what would happen is, uh, you'd be the big banker. And this is where I think I had things the wrong way around. And I think Fomenko might have the wrong way around. And I think Wilson and Blackett are way too trusting. I mean, this is the bizarre thing. They are seen as being uh, alternative historians or people taking the narrative apart. What I've discovered reading this more and more, they are really conservative. Particularly Alan. Alan Wilson is a real academic. He goes with the books. He follows the... the the evidence takes it where it takes him. Very analytical, very engineering, and very, very uh, trusting. He takes the sources at face value. And I would like to add, another reason this ties in with their work, is that Fomenko and that do not uh, go into the British stuff that we look at. The old charters, the triads, um, the genealogies, the stones, all those kind of things. Those sources they don't look at which I think makes those sources even stronger, because they're not, uh, even YOLO stuff or these stuff, they're way beyond that, because you've got physical evidence, and you can visit the sites. So the way it works is, uh, I tell you I found this um, amazing um, uh, manuscript, and you want it in the Medici, and I say, oh yeah, it'll take me, um, it's up in Germany, some monk has contacted me, uh, he's going to be coming down to Florence soon. He's going to bring the book with him. It'll be about six months. Take advance payments. Take bigger payments. Wait a year. Still nothing happens. I go off to see him. All right. Still not happening. All right. The thing is dragging on and on and on. <clears throat> and then finally, the, the manuscript turns up. Now, what's weird, there's no mention of the original he copies from. The idea, presumably, is he's found this ancient manuscript as he says himself, he can write uh, Latin better than the ancients can. He's fluent. No originals provided. No details of where the original was are provided. Even the copy that he makes goes to uh, the Medici private library and then the Vatican. Now, all the copies we have in the world all come from those originals, which have no provenance. This is how deep this goes. I know there's people out there already aware of this, but I'll take it a little bit further and tie it back into British hidden history in a minute, okay? So where they come from for these stories? Now, with Fomenko, what they look at there is the fascinating parallels between... Their argument is that what they're really doing is taking real papers, they think there are real manuscripts, and they must be medieval and they are just changing the dates and possibly the names to put them further back into ancient history. And in some cases, you can see where this talks about. Uh, for example, the campaigns of Alexander the Great. There they are, sure enough. They fight them with pikes, just like Renaissance soldiers fight with pikes. And there was a campaign in the 15th, 16th century, which went around all the same sort of route Alexander the Great did. And the timelines and everything just seems to be copied back to you know, 328 BC, roughly. And it's the same story done again. So there's, there's that kind of angle. That's their angle. The other thing they try and do, of course, is project this idea of, and this is where the problem comes in, of a massive Genghis Khan, Russian-type empire, Tartar empire, which ruled the world. And this is where I've read flags, literally, <laughs> red flags, because it was a uh, Communist Party research and you get a feeling they were trying to create their history. So in many ways, they're doing the same scam, if you like, that the Italians and the Greeks were doing, and they've kind of cottoned on to their version of it. It's how it feels to me, but I'm not an expert on that. But what they have done very good, well, is their analysis of the other histories. Right, so what happens? This guy, Bracciolini, let's make sure I mix it up, one of these two, it must be Bracciolini, because he's the writer, he's the brains of the outfit, 
He disappeared. He's dead. We can't see him. Oh, you can't see him. Sorry. I can see him. Thank you, Arnie. <clears throat> this guy being Bracciolini, okay? I find his Italian names difficult for some reason. Poggio is easier to remember. Right. Um, this is the key where I think it ties in with Wilson and Blackett's work. As well as, if you want to see the real chronology uh, pulled back into place, this is the book. This is Alan Wilson's favourite book that he wrote. This is the one he's most proud of. It's the one I like the most. Uh, it's the first one I went into. It tells you all about, you know, camera glyphics, how to read hieroglyphs. And then what he does, he straightens out all the the, the dynasties, shows how some are, are, are written behind each other from Manetho, when actually they should be next to each other, when there's more than one king at the same time, the gaps are taken out. All the things they talk about in Flamenco are answered in here. So, I, I mean, the genius of Alan Wilson is just... He was doing all what they were doing, on his own, more or less, with Baron helping with the filing and stuff. And this whole team of scientists and statistics and everything didn't get as far as Wilson and Blackett did. Maybe because they were trying to, whatever, but this is just the genius of this. Right, so what happens is, this this guy here, Bracciolini, he, uh, oh, that's a bit distracting, all that on the screen. He, he goes off and disappears for uh, a couple of years. Now, this is the period when a lot of the papers were... Uh, Tacitus particularly were due to be delivered but they weren't delivered now in the Flamenco version of events they say officially he went to London whereas unofficially they say they think it was actually a red herring and he really went to Hungary and he took his history and ideas from there well I'll argue <coughs> what if he actually did go to London what if he did come to Britain and the reason why he went to Britain is because he needed a pre-written history. You can't just write a fiction. It won't stand up. You need to base your history on something. And all those stories, you need the timelines, you need some consistency. Or maybe it's just some weird thing they've got going on. But they would use an existing history and mould it to their wants. And this is why I think we start to get into what Wilson and Black had hit on in uh, Arturius Rex Discovered, and we talked about this idea of the mirror -like lineages where you've got the British kings matching the Roman emperors. Now, it's always assumed that any coincidence is due to uh, British kings, historians, trying to claim a history they don't have. And so they claim that they go back to important people, whether it be Jesus or it be Romans and, and their Roman emperors were actually British kings. But if we start looking at this from an analytical point of view, oops, sorry, I should have shown him as well. There's Nicolai Nicolini. Uh, sorry, there's Nicolini. Just give you an idea of these trustworthy characters look like. Now, if you get an idea, the, with the British record of events, who the kings were, what happened, we do have physical evidence. Even the Roman account has to acknowledge that they came from Britain, because that's where they're buried. You can see their gravestones, you can see the places named after them. Uh, you can just The whole thing is there. So they, they were real people, and they were there. The question, of course, is were they Roman? Or were they, whatever Roman means, or were they British kings, as claimed by the British history? So what it seemed to me fits in very plausibly with this whole story as they come over to Britain, where they found the British historical records. Oh, hang on a second. And they would then transpose that to create the whole idea of an ancient Roman Empire. The whole thing. And I'm not the first to say that uh, it's created, because in the, the, the books here, they give a lot of evidence about uh, Rome being, you know, the more than a f fishing village, medieval times. Uh, the big buildings that are famous, like the Hippodrome Colosseum, all that, they're not referenced in, in earlier dates. No one talks about them. Travellers don't comment on them. They seem to be a much more modern building. If you look at the 
the decay of the buildings, if you look at the first photographs from about 1840s, 1850s, the buildings uh, look fairly pristine, fairly new. The decay since then, the last 170, 180 years, is enormous. And people say it's car traffic and pollution and stuff like that, but it seems not to quite ring true that the pollution in the last 180 years is greater than the pollution of the previous almost 2,000 years, which is the comparison. So what they argue is the buildings are built 15, 1600s, they're only a couple hundred years old at that point, and then they get aged. And once you start to get into this idea, what what's... I'm almost obsessively reading these books alongside the Wilson and Blackett books is because a lot of the questions and things they, they bring up are answered for them. This is this is the amazing thing about it. All that stuff they showed there about the, the, um, the idea of the sorry, the Egyptian pharaohs, the chronology's not working, the date's not matching. They do after this. This is the, this is the tragedy. These books not getting widely respected. It's absolutely tragedy because what they do then is put them in order. Having the advantage to be able to read hieroglyphs helps because none of them could do that. So that's... Uh, Anyway, that's a quick look at all the, yeah, all lies and tricks. Yeah, it's a bit too much, isn't it, to, uh, right, the damage is that if you say Constantine the Great was born in Yorkshire, so was British, the reaction is shock. Yeah, I think that's changing a bit. I think in those articles I showed earlier on the, um, from the BBC thing, there was that Constantine was British. I meant to mention that on the thing earlier. But you're right, anything like that. Um, it's like, picture it or it never happened. <laughs> yeah. Send Fomenko the books, Ross. Yes, no, right. I was thinking about this, actually. <laughs> Not the first person to say that. Thank you, as it said, send Fomenko the books. Uh, so I got my glass on. Zal, Zal, Zai? I, right, yes, good suggestion. Yeah, do we know if Fomenko's still alive? We should look him up and say, uh, hey, mate, all those puzzles you set are answered in here. And I would also argue that the Arturius Rex books answers the puzzle with where they got their inspiration from to do... Um, to write about uh, this line of Roman emperors. And of course, you mentioned before, uh, Scaligeri, his uh, father's name was Julius Caesar, slightly suspicious. And he had friends called Tacitus and Pliny and all these names, Plutarch. The names seemed to have just been lifted up his mates and family. This is how crude this was in a way. And it's just amazing how it's just, just not a uh, question. I mean, I wouldn't have thought of questioning this uh, a few years ago and the whole idea that our chronology and timeline so uh that gets difficult right so i've i feel like i've covered way 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 too much for um one talk already because it's just too much to take in really what i'm trying to do is build it to a stage where i can um show you i think this all can be put together uh using wilson and blackett using fomenko a few other sources and I think what we're going to find is that the, the British timeline is also very different to what even uh, Wilson and Blackett realised, which is another interesting point. And because one of the keys I want to make here, when I say about Wilson and Blackett being trusting, uh, for example, uh, radio carbon dating, one of the biggest jokes of all, okay? It, it's, it's, it's got like a, a tolerance of like 3,000 years. Uh, there's examples where living mollusks have been dated to hundreds of years into the future. There's a medieval castle in uh, England dated to 14,000 years ago. It, it's it's a scandal. It's an absolute scandal and a scam. Same with dendrochronology. These dating methods are f fixed. Now, what's... Um, oh, because I'm tight, darling. Where I'm saying Wilson and Black are trusting, they look at all the... Egyptology dates and they say what they've done they've taken the real radiocarbon dating date and then they divide it by 100 and times it by 80 to change the dates to match what they think they should be they've added or subtracted 20 percent I would argue or from what I've read about it and I get my chronology quarterlies from the scientific people all that kind of stuff it's it's just it's not a case just add 20 percent or take 20 percent off 
It's like, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. 90 odd percent of all the results get binned. They get called, oh, it must be contaminated or it's crazy answers. They only take the answers they uh, uh, think you're going to fit the time frame, and that's what you run with. It's that bad. It's crazy. And if you want to have a good Tendo chronology, have a look. Cut down um, uh, or find a piece of wood, particularly uh, European softwoods, and try and look at the, the rings. They can't do it. And I'll just say one last thing to end, just as um, it's been bugging me for ages, because they're... It's a Sunday evening, no one's to do statistics, all right? But I'm going to throw in a couple of statistical terms. Don't freak out. <laughs> all right? In fact, I might not even use the statistical terms, right? It's like Gaussian statistics, things like this. And this is the latest thing. They do the same thing with global warming to try and make straight lines, uh, radiocarbon dating, dendrochronology, all these things. They use the same statistical tricks. My degree was maths and stats, all right? I could see all this nonsense back when I was doing it and the way they, uh, things being run on uh, models and numbers were a load of nonsense and all this. And I got out of it. It's just it's ridiculous. So one of the tricks is is, is using them. Um, you've got a bunch of dots on a graph. All right. So if you've got a nice dot, 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 you could draw a line through it. All right. And, you know, we used to do with a line of best fit. You've probably done that at school. Yes. 160 watts in. 90. Good grief. Well, you're going to put me off now. I get nervous. <laughs> so you've got dot, 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 straight line. All right. Or dot, 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 dot. We'll make a curve. That's line the best fit. And you can do it by your eye quite often, you know, and that's there's different mathematical formulas. I'm not going to blow people's brains, all right? But uh, what you'll do is then you'll draw a line and you'll work out how far either side of the line all the dots are. And you kind of add them up. You have to use a bit of calculus, all right? To work out which line gives you the least distances away from it from all the dots. Does that make sense? I think it does, doesn't it? When you get onto these uh, Gaussian statistics and stuff like that, this is where it starts to go bonkers. You look at the dots you get for something like a radiocarbon dating graph or a global warming graph or whatever. There's your page. Like that. The dots are all over the place. Sorry, you won't really hear me if I'm not careful. Dots are all over the place. But you can plug them in and by using statistical means uh, you can make a line you can make a line fit <laughs> it's, it, it's it's absolutely bonkers because you can see your common sense can tell you there's no line fit but mathematically you can make a line fit and you can make that line almost anything you want to I'll give one other example uh, which is um, it might explain uh, yeah this might explain the theory of how this kind of statistics works all right it's not a statistic pro. I don't want to spoil your Sunday evenings. <laughs> I hated the subject by the end. Right, look at this. Oh, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Things I'm finding in my parents' house since we moved in. There you are. Charles and Di, 81. Wonderful, eh? Ich Dean. <laughs> Good royalist. See, I come from a family that could not be more conservative. You know, teachers, lecturers, dad in the Air Force. Let's watch every royal event on the telly. Marching guards every Sunday, uh, you know, the uh, trooping the colour, all that. Spent half my childhood on airfields looking at Harrier jump jets, and so this is. I'm not some radical, right? <laughs> I never have been. This has shocked me. I'm just sharing as we find things. So anyway, imagine this is. Um, I'm going to play a game. All right, I'm going to put this here on the table. Where you probably can't see it. And Arnie and I are going to get uh, little balls of paper. And we're going to try and throw them to get them in the cup. All right? Oh, that sounds fun. That'd be a good fun game. Well, a bit like golf, right? We're all going to try and chip and get them in the hole. We're not really going to do it, aren't we? Because I have any room. You're going to imagine, all right? I always get all excited. <laughs> like, all right, we'll do the game later. We'll do it. Yeah. So what you would do, all right? If we put that on the floor over there and we all chucked balls of paper at it, what you would have uh, on the floor is, the, ho is the, the, the hole, if it's a golf hole or the cup. And you'd have everything scattered around it. All right? So the idea is then, if you plugged in all these uh, misses and took an average, you, you can work out where the hole is. All right, was it? And there's a certain logic to that, if you make sense. I, I, except, um, you know, maybe there's a slope and they're all going to fall this way because of a slope. Or maybe um, this cup is too far away. <laughs> People just can't throw it far enough. 
and nearly all of them drop short, in which case the stats would tell you the hole is here somewhere. Or if it's at the if there's a slope like this, or or they after we've missed, they'll all roll away. It might tell us it's down here. They do the same thing with cannonballs, they try to aim them and stuff. So it's not really accurate anyway. But also, if you're using things like radio carbon dating or global warming or that kind of stuff, look, what actually are you measuring anyway? Is there a target to be aimed for? All by assumption, all by models. It's all basically nonsense. So that dating has to go out. And a lot of people get quite upset at this point and they say, well, it's the best we've got. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You can't pretend it works, all right? We can't live in a fairy tale land where we pretend our dating system works. Sadly, it's the same for sedimentary, where the idea is year after year, you get a couple of milligrams of um, dust or dirt building up on the floor of a cave or something. It doesn't work like that. It might be nothing for years, and then a storm or something comes along and dumps two feet. None of these systems work. I know it's, it's a shock, it's horrible. It's the, the cart leads the donkey. You get this Scaligarian ladder, you're told where the dates are, and the science, such as it's called, is bent to fit what they want to find. And I'm just going to go back quickly on that one, because getting back to the start of where we were, the key to all this of radiocarbon dating, and you can look at uh, Libby and the guy who invented it and everything, the only way you can work it, make it work is to have an anchor point somewhere back in history which you are certain of and you've got an item from that period which you're certain of and you can measure the carbon-14 decay rate and from that you've got a point where you can measure the, the carbon-14 levels. This is why it went wrong with the mollusk. You assume a living creature like me has got whatever, the numbers are tiny, you know, 2 in 10 million carbon-14 or something. So even miscounting is easy. Uh, therefore, that's going to drop by a half life down to a small number. So if the number on the curve is here, that's how far back it was. Well, the thing they found, like the mollusk, for example, had incredibly high carbon-14, <laughs> just even though it's still alive. So that ruins everything, because <laughs> it must be in the future, because it to fit on the graph. So what they did was they got some early dates. Wilson and Blackie go through all this. But it's, it's even worse than they thought. And they find some dates from Ramses II, some items. So yes, we know the date of this. Therefore, you can anchor your radiocarbon dating scheme. <clears throat> Look at the range of dates. There's thousands of years between them. How can they possibly have a date of anything they can anchor? Uh, Wilson and Black is showing miles out anyway. They, 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 they go into, um, like, uh, which is the grave... Uh, Tutankhamun or one of those uh, from that sort of era where they find an, an, an iron dagger before iron's been explored, uh, discovered. You might think maybe we got the date of the tomb wrong. No, no, that's not what archaeologists do. Archaeologists and historians don't say maybe we got the date wrong. They say, oh my goodness, someone made iron a thousand years before they thought they did. Therefore, it must be uh, meteoric iron. It must have come from a meteor. And people swallow this up. We're fed this. We have to learn to look at it and think, uh, as Wilson Blackett do, read things literally and really think, does it make sense or is it all nonsense? What sense can we make of it? And then do research and get the stats out, get uh, research of these kind of people, and then hopefully we can start to dig at what really happened, which is where I want to go to with the Britain's history and particularly what's known as the Roman era and when that actually might have been, who it was, and how it digs directly into our British history. So there you go. It's a bit of a ramble. <laughs> Some people like the rambles. I, I, I got this horrible feeling I tried to cover way, 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 way too much tonight. And I, I apologise for that. Um, it's difficult to know how to balance it, isn't it? Because I'm so excited about all this stuff. And I've seen how all this all fits. And it doesn't need to be a puzzle. Oh, yeah, there was one more thing I was going to say, wasn't it? Sorry. About the one thing I think, um, this is conspiracy theory time now, okay? And uh, I know that word's been weaponized. It's not a bad thing to discuss conspiracy theories, okay? It doesn't mean you're a nutter or anything. What did I see an article the other day? Um, what used to be called uh, corruption investigating. <laughs> it's now called conspiracy theories. 
so we can investigate the corruption, right? Because everything's oh, investigating corruption. That's that's a good thing, <laughs> as opposed to conspiracy theorists, nutter, right? <clears throat> Where I think Fomenko and that missed a trick, and I wasn't going to go into this more next week, really, but I'll just drop it in now, since everyone's been so good, and there's so many people uh, uh, online tonight. <laughs> I'm getting a bit carried away because I was going to save this, but the the, the assumption here is that these guys were ripping off uh, the Medici's and their sponsors. These guys, they were all there ripping them off, okay? They would, they would ask, they would, they would approach them. The assumption seems to be they would approach the Medici's and say, hey, we found this manuscript up in some, or a, a monk from Germany has written me a letter. I mean, this is ludicrous. This is what frustrates you when you see the the way in which British records are tortured. I mean, if any of this, even the slightest hint of any of this happened with British history, it'd be thrown out. Gildas is supposed to be written in the 6th century. It's almost contemporary to what happened. And still people f pulling it apart. And if you look at um, something else I'm going to do soon, Wilson or Blackett do as well, it's a similar thing that happens with uh, the Egyptian stuff with Menetho and you have to untangle all the dynasties and put them in order it's the same with um, some of the ancient British history and that will shock some people people like Malmud and people like that and not the dates they think they've done the same thing there it's it's genius you know it's absolutely brilliant but yeah so the, the, the way the story goes they would say oh we found this writer uh, like Pliny or all these people weren't even referred to really in medieval times as I said on Wikipedia, this kind of disappeared for a thousand years. And then, oh, we found a mouldy old copy, a thousand years old, in archaic language, and I've copied it. Have you got the original? No, it's just falling apart. Left, left, left it there. Have you got the copy you made? No, it's in the library over there. So what have you got? Well, I've got this copy of the copy. And how do I know it's true? Well, you know, of course it is. <laughs> that, that's the logic. i got a feeling, looking the other way around on this, that the Medici's were not conned. They were bankers. They weren't stupid. They didn't have someone turn up and say, just found this document. Uh, do you want to buy it? Yeah, here's, in modern money, here's £10 million for it. They wouldn't do that. They'd say, where's the provenance? Where's the original? Where's the proof? I want the proof. I want the evidence. What's the name of this monk you're meeting? What's the name of this, uh, uh, whatever, abbey in, up in Germany or something? They'd want more confirmation. They, none of that seems to have happened at all. And they've handed out the money. they paid the money. Wouldn't it seem more likely that these people were actually commissioned to produce the work? It's the other way around. The Medici's needed this history to bolster their own uh, antiquity and standing. And their partners in this were the, the church. And I think where this gets huge, and I'm going to go on to next week, is this all ties in with the whole uh, founding of what's known as the Holy Roman Church and the idea of a Roman Empire. That's how big it is. So maybe people have seen this before elsewhere, but I've got there myself through following the clues, and I'm very, very excited. <laughs> I might even do an extra video during the week, a live chat if people are up for meeting say Thursday, 8 o'clock, uh, I'm going to kite on there, because it's a lot for a Sunday evening, because Sunday evening is usually a bit of a laugh, isn't it? The boys play the instruments, I'll try to sing a song, news, all that kind of stuff, but we got a little bit uh, digging and digging and digging and digging and digging. What have we got here? Contrived and commissioned history, exactly. Yes. Right, so I hope you people enjoyed that. You're going to play us out, Arnie, please? Of course. Uh, what would you like? The Medici's commissioned them to do the forgeries. Yeah, so Susie Logan's come up with that as well. But I think I know... Um, I think I know... Uh, well, I've given quite a bit away already, but I think I know how they did it, what records they used. And this is uh, going a bit further for Menko, Wilson and Blackett have done. Because I don't think... Um, I don't think Alan Wilson that really thinks like this. You know, they tend to be... Uh, I mean, they, they just, they, they do, they're incredibly honest. <laughs> they're like, uh, they get so badly maligned and called all sorts of things. And they're the most honest people I know. They just give it to you straight. This is what we found. There it is. Um, they don't seem to have the, the
beguile in some ways to think that maybe it's because they've been on the defensive so much and defending people like Yolo and people like that and they've been attacked and called everything. I mean, put so far on the defensive, it's been waiting for them to go the other way and say, well, actually, you prove your point. You give me the background to all these Roman claims and all that kind of stuff. Okay, anyway, it's getting quite late now, isn't it? School play? nights, 25 to 10. Oh, my goodness. What, what should I play? Pardon? What, anything you'd like me to play? Any requests, Ronnie? Come on, any special requests? Oh, I tell you what. While, while people have a chance, I have a chance to say goodbye to everyone. With all this <laughs> talk of Italian corruption, now, can you play The Godfather? Yeah. Something from The Godfather. Can oh, you play I that? Can, actually. It's crazy. It's like a jukebox, isn't it? You just, just tell them a song. And... Let's be a bit near the mic so people can hear it. We should have had this play where we went through the whole, um, the way it was done, wasn't it? Oh, just loosen your bow. All right, that's okay. All right, well, thank you, everyone. I'm just amazed how many people are watching online. Oh, my yeah, goodness. Like 160 at one point. I mean, maybe we are. Fantastic. Okay. Right, off we go in. Thank you very much, everyone. There's, keep going on. One thing I didn't mention, thank you very much, Alan Reese. He has uh, donated, or given me, uh, one of those hunting cameras, which is... It was outside and is motion sensitive. And up by the Preacher's Rock, I think we're going to make a hole up there. We'll stick it in. And anyone nicking stones from now on, we're going to have them and prosecute them. I'm going to get a sign up uh, for St. Peter's up on Money of the Gear, if you're not aware of it. There's the site of the first century church. Uh, the church is saying now is more recent. But it's a very important site, and people are nicking the stones. And there's less every time you go back. We're going to stick a camera up there and nail them and prosecute them, all right? So anyone out there watching this, you be warned. And it's going to be taken extremely seriously. I just let people know it's a protected ancient monument. I think you can get 10 years, I think. So we are. Oh, Moonlight Sonata. Do you know that one? Hey, anyway, finish this one. Even though they tried to bomb them. Oh, you don't talk about that. <laughs> Full moon tonight. Oh, is it? Oh, fantastic. No Martin tonight. I was watching their thing about him about what the moon is. <laughs> So we are sticking to history here, okay? I'm not going to Tartar and all that. That is elsewhere. Oh, beautiful, aren't he? He's, oh, fine, he's, fine, he's, he's finally starting to get the hang of that violin, isn't he? He's getting the hang of it on at last. <laughs> we'll hear Moonlight Sonata for next week. Do you know that? No. That's what I used to play on the piano. How did you go? I might, I might know it. Oh, I can't remember the tune. I might know it. It's fine. Yeah, you might. I used to play on the piano. It was my favourite. Ba 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 ba. No, that's not it. No, oh, I mean, like Sonata, he's played like a thousand times on the piano. <laughs> thank you, all the thank yous coming in. Oh, thank you very much, everyone. Else? There's some sketches there. Now I've got to say a special hello uh, to someone who's in Tom Tig, but I don't don't know your proper name, so um, unfortunately, uh, Morgan's uncle. I'm going to call you. All right, because <laughs> I've been looking out for your comments. I I haven't seen your name on here, so you must have a a, a pseudonym. Moon is 76%. Yeah, I don't think it's a full moon. Uh, Gary, Mo David Moser. Yeah, is David on tonight? I haven't seen David. Oh, there's so many other things coming up. So we we'll do the dreaming next week. Take a bit more on this. I have to go back uh, next week and also... Or else we talk about next week, aren't we? There's the... I don't know. Yeah, more stuff for King Arthur conspiracy. Anyway, loads and loads of things. Look out for this videos this week. Please sign up for the new... Uh, what do I call it? Welsh History Stories. The brain's not very good tonight. I think I rambled a bit. I do apologise. I try and be a little bit more direct usually. No, I, I do ramble, don't I? But the, yeah, the new channel, all the videos are going to be little six, seven minutes. Uh, just little quickies. They're not going to be anything complicated. Hang on, that Moonlight is not as annoying me. I used to play it on the piano. <laughs> on a regular basis. And I can't even remember it now. Hang on. All right, the show has finished. So if you have to go, don't worry. You're not going to miss anything. Oh, school God, tomorrow. Gee. I know those, it's a family-friendly programme. I didn't do any introduction or welcome tonight. I do apologise. Welcome. Beethoven. Yeah. I've got to break copyright now. Be careful, on. You listen just a few seconds, right? I can't hear it. Well, that's not a use, isn't it? I can't hear it anyway. There we go. Marvellous. All right, we'll leave it for next week, okay? And I, I'm, I can't believe I've forgotten it. Because it's one of my favourites. My brain's not with it tonight. Right, just a coastal snoom army from...
Tom. Oh, Patricia's having some terrible weather up in Canada. Could everyone send their love out to uh, the people of Canada? Uh, particularly oh, up in BC where Patricia is. They're having like the weirdest weather. Extremely cold. Tsunami. And then hot. And then, yeah, and then warm water melting the snow. And it's just horrendous. So we're not sure what's going on up there. They're really having a bad time. Anyway, so good night from me from everyone. Do you want to put one more happy song on? Let's see if everyone will smile. We like to finish this smile, don't we? Which one? I don't know. I don't know. Men of Harlech or something. Just something jolly. There we go. Right, so thank you very much, everybody. Please thank your supporters of the channel. Um, if you could hit the join button. I'm <laughs> put a couple of quid a month in. really help. <laughs> As there are lots of people to do a little. It's a good idea. Or become a Patreon. Thank you for those who already have. Uh, try and come up with some bonuses and stuff. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've been running this on love and, and goodwill. So thank you very much, everyone. And, uh... Well, da, 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 da. Until next week. Oh, my God, i got to press the button, haven't I? Is it three? Um, oh. <laughs> I'm going to bed anyway, school in the morning. Okay, go so, on. All right, till next time, have a go. Hello. <laughs> Go watch now. This is the lag, you see. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Oh, I'll leave the chat on a little bit longer so you can uh, continue saying good night to each other and uh, discussing whatever you like. Okay. All right. Good night now. bank transfers and stuff so i'd rather you do if you want to set a bank transfer is um order a book go to the cameraglyphics.com buy a book that'd be better you make a few pounds in each book and we share that with wilson and blackett as well so uh pick a book from there and we can send you a, a bank transfer thing if we used to do that don't forget the zodiac videos with hugh are coming up this week and the book is already for sale and King Arthur Conspiracy pre-sales will go up soon. So you could maybe buy one of those. It would be a great way to support. Thank you very much. Anyway, good night.